Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Friday, the 27th day of January, year of our Lord, 2023. I do pray this finds you well. Snow tomorrow looks like, and, and then the temperature is going to get really cold for just a couple of days. But it looks like uh, the worst snow, at least uh, I checked the weather just a short while ago, is going to be north of Interstate 80, so on the north side of the Quad Cities and get gradually worse. But you never know until it, it starts to snow, the, the track could change. Anyway, check on your neighbors. Give me a call if you need something. Um, and remember, it's going to be bitter cold on Monday, and then it's going to moderate later in the week. Um, so be back to kind of regular late January, early February. February this week, February weather. Uh, the end's in sight, uh, Lord willing. Uh, we'll have uh, some moderating weather, and March will be here soon enough. Uh, looking ahead, speaking of, of uh, late February, March, February 22nd is Ash Wednesday. Easter is April 9th this year. Uh, Emmanuel will not be participating in the round robin, um, the, the pastor's exchange. Once in a while, it's okay to do that, but uh, kind of make, maintaining the continuity with my people. Uh, and anyway, we already talked about that, but the, uh, uh, I'll share soon what the theme will be. Also, um, we'll have asbestos abatement on Monday. Uh, we have a definite date from the contractors. Asbestos abatement will occur in the cafeteria and some of the ancillary rooms. Uh, get that asbestos tile off the floor. I don't, it's, I don't know if it's the tile proper or the glue, but anyway, it's all going to be taken care of. And then uh, once that's taken up, uh, the gym will be, or the cafeteria will be okay to use. Uh, might be some time before the tile comes in, depending on when those contractors can get it. Uh, but we'll still be able to use the cafeteria, which is going to be important because Lent is coming. And we have the dinners and everything. So also youth group this coming Sunday from 5.30 to 7.30. We changed the time a little bit. 5.30 to 7.30, moved it up an hour. Uh, I think for the sake of some of the adults, Myself too is a long day for me, and for the kids, uh, they you know they have to things they also need to do when we're all done to get ready for school, and some of them are coming from uh, from maybe a distance away. So this coming Sunday, five thirty to seven thirty, youth group at Emmanuel. Uh, we have the lock-in coming in February. That'll be at Concordia Geneseo. That's going to be a lot of fun and a lot of good uh, um, catechesis too, along with fun. And then Bible Bowl will be in March. I'll share the dates for that. And uh, then uh, we're going to go down uh, to uh, Mount Calvary, I think, in in in, in April, uh, Mount Calvary in Galesburg, which should be a lot of fun. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last, amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High. To herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Tonight, we read from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 24. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time there is a remnant, chosen by grace. But if it is by grace... It is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what, was, what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. 
Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch, then, as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow make my fellow Jews jealous, and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as firstfruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. This is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches and the severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. And even then, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? And that is the word of the Lord. So Paul continues his theme, predestination, election, um, and again, focusing on the Israelites. And one of the things that's interesting about this chapter is he prays for his countrymen and you know he reminds the Gentiles, the, the former outsiders, that they have been grafted, and that's where we finished up. But this idea that, that God would use the faith of the Gentiles to make the Jews jealous, these Israelites jealous, so that they might turn and also be saved, be grafted back in again. And the point I want to make about that, and this is the main point I wish to share this evening, is that you know, you never know what God is doing. I mean, we know how it is that we're saved. That's not what I'm talking about. We know the, the big picture of people. But the day-to-day -day life uh, in the faith, the life of those around us, people we often love, and, and their unbelief, and the people who've grown up in the church and who left the church, that's something that we struggle with now in our age, people leaving the church because they have bought what the culture teaches for any number of reasons. Well, you know, it, it leaves us with a hard heart, and it certainly makes us angry at times. It makes me angry as a pastor, but it also makes me quite sad. Yeah, but the prayer is that they will always be grafted back in. But you never know what God's going to do to get them to open their eyes. God's desire is that everyone would be saved. And getting in by the skin of your teeth is still getting in. Remember, a spark of faith is still a spark of faith. We pray for those people constantly. We have we have dialogues with them when the time is right, when, when we can. You know, if, if you're married to somebody like that or have a, a child in the house or maybe a parent in the house that's an unbeliever, if you're a child or, or a former believer, you know how difficult it can be. And you can't talk about it 24-7 because, you know, you, you want to know, I don't know how productive that would be, but you also know there are times that we should be speaking, and we do. And they may or may not listen. You don't, but my point is you don't know what, what God's going to do what other people he's going to use to influence, what they're going to see, what they're going to experience. Um, he'll use suffering. Jealousy, we hear here. Jealousy, you know, jealousy. And, and, and I think that's kind of an interesting example because you think about people outside the faith and their anger. I was just reading something today about these poor people who support the taking of a human life because it's inconvenient for them. You know, or all the other examples that, that we get to, and, they, and they, they're so angry. And they you know, do the most hateful and say the most hateful things. Wishing people would be dead. I heard the governor of Michigan, it was a quote, so I didn't hear it, I read it, that you know, her, her quote, the quote is that abortion is good for the economy. You know, I, I, you know, do I 
I certainly don't like that, and it does make me angry to think about it, but you know, I certainly pray for that woman and those who are caught in her snare. But my, going back to the point is that, you know, that's an obvious one that's kind of around us now ever since the Dobbs decision came out down, and particularly in a state like Illinois. You know, we'll have a governor that'll sign anything that comes over his desk uh, without any thought, any thought whatsoever. Well, we vote him in. I didn't, but, you know, you know people do. Anyway, I wonder if getting back to the text, if if you know they, they look at us and can't and I've had people like this in my life, they just can't fathom that this is real. That the love that we share, the joy that we have, the peace, our households are peace. I've shared with you before how I didn't know it when I was a kid because not everybody had a family like mine. And found out as a young man that people didn't, you know, your eyes kind of get open. Uh, as my parents, they weren't overprotective, but they shielded us. It doesn't mean I wasn't a sinner. It doesn't mean our house didn't have sinners. Of course it did. But you know, everyone would come and hang down, hang out out at our house. My buddies, my sister's friends. Um, when my brother got older, his friends. It was the house, this tiny little house in the suburbs that people wanted to hang out in because there, it was this safe haven, which I came to realize. And it was filled with joy. There were boundaries. So, yeah, my dad could, would come downstairs and say, you know, knock, knock it off. Or we, you know, cross the line. We were, you know, we, we, we certainly were called to repentance. Um, but, you know, we stayed inside the boundaries. Say the, let's say the commandments. And it was glorious. I, and, and it was. It was this wonderfully safe place. Um, wonderfully joyous place. And I think, you know, one of the things God does, we're looking at, chapter 11 here of Romans, is that, you know, he makes other people jealous of us, and that opens their eyes, you know, that they, and I think that's where the anger starts first, is that, you know, you know, that, that, you know, they, and I've, I, I've had personal experience with this, people just think we're a bunch of phonies, and no, we're not, you know, we are joyful people, you know, I, I, I laugh about, you know, Lutheran pastors like myself being grumpy, and there are certainly plenty of times I am, um, and that grumpiness, if, my newsletter coming out, like, or maybe it was the last one. I write a lot of them. It talks about why we're perceived as grumpy, and it's for your protection. But, you know, if you spend time around me, there's a lot of laughter. As I, you know, is when I spend time around you. We tell jokes, we laugh, we enjoy each other's company. Um, we love the gifts that God has given us, and we're there weeping when, when, when uh, one of us is sick or hurting. Uh, we're there to provide aid and comfort where we can. Uh, to help each other, it's a you know it's it's a wonderful thing, and people outside of it just don't know what to make of it, you know. And but maybe through that, their eyes are open. So my point is, you never know what God's going to. That's just one example, and there are many. The suffering that people endure that opens their eyes, the um, the conversations that they have with you never know what God is going to do in somebody's life. To open their eyes or reopen their eyes and have them turn and once again you know, see the great gift of Jesus Christ our Lord. Very interesting chapter here when, when Paul talks with, with sorrow and sadness about his brothers and sisters, the Israelites. And uh, you know, did he have family that he was now estranged from? Probably. Probably. Uh, anyway, uh, fascinating. We'll go on. You know, we're, we're still going to talk about. Paul's going to talk a little bit more about predestined election, and I think then we'll, we'll, uh, we're, we're going to be changing books, and I'm a few days behind the lectionary. I think we'll, uh, we'll jump off of Romans and move on to uh, another writing. Plus, with Lent coming, we'll, we'll change this all up again too, just according to the day lectionary. So, all right. Now, let's confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Believe in God, the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you within the nations and the glory of your people Israel. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, may we, as we prepare to celebrate the great gifts of our Lord Jesus Christ this weekend, may we, me and my brothers in office, be resolved to know among our people the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and Him crucified, and that this wonderful news of our Lord crucified for us, for you, uh, for you, my brothers and sisters, for all those around us, that this knowledge would spread throughout the entire world. For those who are filled for, with so much hatred that their eyes would be open and, and uh, would stand alongside us proclaiming your holy name. Be with those who are persecuted and oppressed. Strengthen them, keeping them strong in their confession until that day to stand before your throne. And as always, we pray for the sick and the dying. Tonight we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, Myron, Dennis, Dave, and Don, Ardo, Klaus, Deanna, Cammie, my brother in office, Dale, dear friends of our congregation, Joan, Liberty, Marlis, Dave, Anita, Jason, Bert, Billy, Russ, Bill, Heather, Joe, Dee, Katie, Dylan, Jeff, Josiah, John, Jason, Camden, Ashley, Paul, Bob, Jim, Tom, Jeff, Christy, Brad, Patricia, and Josiah. Heavenly Father, place your healing hand upon them, giving them comfort uh, through their baptism of a promise of a glorious life that awaits all of us who bear your holy name before your throne. Be with those who care for them that they might be your instruments for their well-being. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. With your hands I commend myself, my body, and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks. Be to God. I'll sing a little bit of hymn 544, O Love, How Deep. O love, how deep, how broad, how high, beyond all thought and fantasy, that God, the Son of God, should take our mortal form for mortal sake. He sent no angel to our race of higher or of lower place, but wore the robe of human frame, and to this world himself he came. That stanzas one and two of 544, O Love, How Deep. And there are seven stanzas altogether. That's a great hymn written by... Thomas Akempis, uh, who died in 1471, so just at the dawn of the Reformation era. With that, my brothers and sisters, I bid you a blessed evening, pleasant rest, by God's grace. We'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.